Welcome to this session of the American College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists Oral History Video Project. We're very fortunate today that we have the opportunity to interview Dr. Louis Ben Caret. Ben has been an active member of the college and been instrumental in the development of the ACOG program in Central and South America. Ben, thank you for coming. Thank you. We're happy to have you with us today, and during this discussion, I'm going to ask you a little bit about your history so that in the future, people will know who would Ben Caret was. Okay. Obviously, you and I have been friends for many, many years, researchers. Tell me a little bit about your background. Now, I know you were born in Puerto Rico. Yes. I was born in Puerto Rico in 1933, had my education there, and eventually, after I finished medical school, came to the United States to do an internship at uh, Letterman Army Hospital in San Francisco. And then I, I served a couple of years in the Air Force, uh, as most of physicians had to in those days. And after that, I took a residency in obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Wisconsin under Dr. Ben Peck. I'm sure you, you knew him quite well. Uh, following that, I went to Yale to do a uh, fellowship in fetal physiology, which got me into the field of research that you were in, so we, we did similar things. Let, before you go on into that, and we will explore that, let's go back a little bit. I'd like to know a little bit more about your childhood in Puerto Rico. Uh, it was unusual for someone to come from Puerto Rico like you did. So where did you go to school in Puerto Rico? Uh, there was, uh, you know, the capital, the main city in Puerto Rico is San Juan. And I was raised in a uh, neighborhood of San Juan called Barrio Obrero, where most of the middle, middle class people with not a lot of uh, monetary means, but uh, very enthusiastic people, ambitious. And my father was a minister. You know what they say about preacher kids? They have this <laughs> desire to succeed. And I was fortunate enough to have a very supportive family that stimulated me to pursue education and uh, provide uh, a, for a future for me and, and for my eventual family. Now, you went to what university? Went to the University of Puerto Rico, which is in, uh, in, in San Juan, but in a smaller area of San Juan called Rio Piedras. And the medical school is there too, so both the university, the college, and the medical school were in the same area. And who was uh, head of the department of OB and at that time at the school? Well, that's an interesting thing because uh, the chairman of the department of OBGYN was a gentleman by the name of Ivan Pellegrino. Dr. Pellegrino was the one who stimulated me to go into OBGYN. And eventually, Dr. Pellegrino uh, left Puerto Rico and went to work at the University of Michigan with uh, J. Robert Wilson. I'm sure you're very familiar with him. Well, eventually, I took a job at the University of Wisconsin as, as, a, as a professor. And after 22 years there, I went to New Mexico to join the department of OBGYN at the University of New Mexico. And who do you think I ran into was there at the time, Dr. Ivan Pellegrino, <laughs> my old chairman. He had left Michigan and had gone to the University of New Mexico. So it was wonderful to be reunited with him and, and work with him again. And J. Robert Wilson also went back to New Mexico. He did. He did. Was yes. he there at the same time you were there? Yes. Yes. We. He was. Uh, he had retired and came to work with us, and continued his uh, work with education with the residents. He was actually the uh, director of the residency program until his unfortunate death in uh, an, an automobile accident. Well, let's go back now into when you went to medical school. Why did you choose? that medical school? Well, uh, it's, it's a long story, but to make it short, I had met this young woman in college, and we wanted to get married. 
And my original plan was to come to the United States and do a, uh, get a postgraduate uh, training in chemistry. So, or physiology, those were my favorite uh, subjects. Well, I was accepted uh, at Harvard to come to do uh, biochemistry. But that meant leaving my girlfriend, whom I wanted to marry, so I elected to stay and study medicine in Puerto Rico so we could get married. So nothing fancy, just uh, I loved her a lot and I wanted to marry her. Well then, after you finished medical school in Puerto Rico, then you came to the States. Came to the United States, uh, like I said, I did the internship, did the residency, uh, and did the fellowship in physiology at the Yale. Let's go back to your uh, internship and your residency. Why did you choose those, the programs which you ultimately went into? Was there some special draw to the coming to the Midwest? <laughs> no. When I was in the Air Force, I was stationed in the Upper Peninsula in Michigan, and the headquarters for that uh, division were in Madison, Wisconsin, so I had to go there for military reasons every so often. And I met Dr. Peckham, learned about the uh, department, and liked it enough that I decided that I wanted to go back there and do the residency. And then the fellowship. During the residency, uh, the NIH put together a, uh, a symposium where they brought researchers in the field uh, of maternal and fetal medicine and to, to try to encourage or stimulate residents to stay in academics. One of the individuals who came for that meeting was Dr. Don Barron. I'm sure you remember him quite well who can be considered one of the fathers of uh, fetal physiology in this country. And I met him, uh, I got very excited w with him, and I made an application to the uh, NIH to get a, a special fellowship to go and train with him. And how long were you there? Two years. Two years. What was your major area of interest during that period of time, that two years? Um, Primarily, transport of amino acids across the placenta. And what laboratory animals were you working with? We worked with pregnant sheep. <laughs> Is that how you got into doing sheep physiology? Exactly, yes. And you continued that? I continued that when I, when I finished the fellowship. Dr. Peckham offered me a position back in Wisconsin. So I went back and got a uh, special uh, grant from NIH, uh, started a laboratory uh, working with uh, fetal physiology in the pregnant sheep. And you continued that for many years. I continued that for a long time. <laughs> As I recall, I was working with humans yes. and you were working with sheep when we first got yes. together on this. Exactly, yes. Now, you decided to leave Wisconsin after a period of time to go to, so what was, the generation of that decision? Right. Uh, I was in the department in Wisconsin 23 years. It, my children had, had uh, grown up, left the house. I felt that it was time to move to a warmer climate uh, place. And the person who was then chair of the department in New Mexico was a lady who had been a resident with me in Wisconsin and who had taken the job as chair of the department in New Mexico. Her name is Gloria Sarto. I think yes. you know her quite yes. well. Gloria asked me to come to New Mexico to help her build the department. It's warm there, nice weather, and it was a challenge and I got excited about it and decided to, to move to New Mexico. And when you were in New Mexico, did you continue your work with sheep? Not for a, for, a, a, for a period of time, but mostly my responsibilities there were to develop the, uh, the uh, fellowship in MFM, Maternal Fetal Medicine, and uh, teaching mostly. I did more, the research that I did in New Mexico and that I still do in New Mexico 
was primarily clinical research. What are you doing now in New Mexico? In New Mexico, I work part-time uh, at the university. I do telecommunications, telemedicine, and I supervise fellows and residents. I do very little clinical work as such. Now, move back just a little bit. You said that you were in the military. Yes. And w that was before you became an OBGYN. What kind I was of a, a, I was a general medical officer. I, it was after my internship. I had not done the residency yet. And where were you stationed? I was stationed in the Upper Peninsula in Michigan in, a, in an Air Force base called Kinchello Air Force Base in Sault Ste. Marie. Did you do any care of women during that period of time? We did. It was a general uh, hospital and we did some obstetrics, but very little. We had, because we didn't have uh, adequate facilities, we referred obstetrical patients to the practitioners in Sault Ste. Marie and they would deliver or have surgery as needed in the hospital in Sault Ste. Marie. Yes, I've been to Kinchelow. It's you a have. rather isolated place. <laughs> yes. Have you ever been back? Well, my oldest, my third son, my third child, oldest son, was born there. So we have been back a couple of times to show him where he was born and where we lived, yes. I'll have to ask you a question. This young lady you wanted to marry, was that Lydia? Yes. <laughs> well, you made a very good choice. <laughs> Thank you. We've gotten to know him. Now, going back, uh, when you were working in all of these areas, were you ever involved with the college during the time that you were in Wisconsin? Or I was involved with the college in Wisconsin. We were District 6 then, but I wasn't as involved as I became when I came to New Mexico. What changed this type of involvement? Um, I think the person primarily responsible for my becoming involved with the college was an obstetrician in Santa Fe. His name is Cleve Pardue. He was then the uh, vice chair of the, of the district. We became friends. Uh, he used to refer patients to me at the university. And uh, through him, I became a member of the section of New Mexico, eventually became vice chair and chair of the section and then on to the to the college uh, as uh, in the district. And now you were a district chair. I became eventually. Uh, I moved up to work with the uh, with the district. Uh, I was secretary of the of the district, then vice chair, and then eventually chair. Now, a few years ago, you became involved with the college's program in Central and South America. Right. Tell me about that. I think thanks to you, who we had had this long relationship on research, you became involved in developing the program Save the Mother uh, in Central America and you asked me to participate in that and be the coordinator uh, between the programs in Central America and, uh, and the college. During that, uh, that uh, the duration of that program, some of the individuals that we work with in Central America uh, voice a desire to develop a relationship of, the, of those countries in Central America with the American College of Obstetricians. So I talked to you and you very graciously agreed to help me develop that and actually you participated to a great extent uh, in the project. And the idea was to develop a section of ACOG in Central America which would belong to District 8, which was the district that I was part of uh, here in, in New Mexico. Uh, during the next, this was like in 2002, 2003, during the next three or four years, with your help, we developed this section and now this section is an integral part of uh, District 8, and they attend the meetings and they're active participants in the college activities. Let me take you back to those early days. What was your impression when you first went to Central America about the status of OBGYN in that area? 
Yeah, that my my impression was that they needed a lot of help in education of the residents, um, in uh, improving the training they got in their programs. They needed more supervision, particularly. I felt I felt that they were on their own too much. So I pretty quickly I. F I identified that as a major need, and I thought that we needed to not only create a section there, but really work in the residency programs to improve the quality of the training they obtain. Which of the countries down there did you see the most in need, and which did you see the least in need, if there was such a country? I'll start with the least in need, uh, and that there were two of them, one Costa Rica, and Panama. I think they were, the, the programs were very good, the level of care render was very good, and uh, they had uh, good leadership. The weakest one, I, I think, was uh, Nicaragua. I thought they needed leadership, and uh, I don't know if because of the political issues with the Sandinistas uh, and, and, and the subsequent government they had, but they just weren't up to par with the other countries, and we had to work harder uh, in, in there. Now, what would you see was the major obstetrical and gynecological problem that they faced? In terms of clinical? Uh, clinical, yeah. I, I think. I can't say one. I think there were three, three, three conditions that were really significantly affecting the care uh, in, in, the, in the countries there. And those uh, conditions were preeclampsia, hypertensive disease in pregnancy, um, infection, um, there was a third one, infection, preeclampsia, postpartum hemorrhage. Those were the big three. And as I recall at that time, they had a maternal mortality rate that was somewhere in the four to 600 range. Right. As a matter of fact, the, 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 the project that I mentioned, Save the Mother, was geared towards preventing maternal death. And we selected, of the six countries, we selected the four that had the highest mortality rates of 400. Costa Rica and Panama were not part of that project because their mortality rate is com almost comparable to this country. And where was the most important uh, or most difficult area of those in which to bring about some change? Well, all three of them were difficult. <laughs> I, I think where I found the greatest difficulty overall was in the fact that the government has a budget, and that budget includes everything, medicine, uh, highways, uh, you name it. They need to use money for that. So the doctors had to be competing with a lot of other demands for money. Therefore, it was very difficult for them to bring improvements to the hospitals and to the residency trainings. And I think that's one, one area where we help them a lot because with the prestige of the college, they were able to get more money from the government allotted to the hospitals and to the care of, of women. What would you say is the current status of the projects in those areas now? Oh, I, th I think it's, uh, the, the project is, is in great shape uh, uh, over the years. The, um, the individuals who work with us have developed ability to handle the project. They are able to uh, conduct uh, certification examinations. They're, they're able to visit uh, and evaluate uh, residency programs. The, they have improved the level of, uh, of training for those residents, and they have brought about a significant improvement in, in patient care. At this time, which would you say is the country that needs the most help from us? Still uh, Nicaragua, right. 
and then a close second, Honduras. Now, because of the success that has been going on in those uh, other areas, and I agree with you that uh, development of residency program standards, evaluation, obviously is going to help. You've now been involved in some of the countries in South America that are very interested. Can you tell me a little bit about where you're working there? Sure. Yes, I, I think, again, thanks to you and to, and to your initiative, we have developed, uh, or there were countries in, in South America who expressed a desire to have similar arrangements as Central America. And we started with Argentina, with which you're very familiar. Uh, Argentina uh, has a section which is in the process of being uh, recognized and assigned to a, to a, a district. Uh, they have been able to develop an examination, which they a certification examination, which they anticipate they'll be able to offer for the first time at the end of this year. They have implemented a program to visit uh, uh, residency programs and accredited them. And I, I think uh, they have done quite well. Uh, we had a meeting with them this morning, as a matter of fact, and we are going to formalize then the presentation of the section to the executive board of the college for uh, approval. Uh, again, Thanks to your efforts, we have developed a relationship with uh, Chile. Uh, Chile, again, has uh, implemented certification examinations, although they're not quite ready to give them yet. Uh, probably they are about a year behind uh, Argentina in that respect. But they, they conduct uh, residency program evaluations quite well, and I think the level of care is excellent. More recently, we have had uh, applications from Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. And uh, we had meeting with them uh, sometime uh, during this week. And we should be in a position to present them for approval by the board sometime uh, this year. Uh, you didn't mention it, but we also have developed a program in the Dominican Republic. Uh, that section is uh, assigned to District 3, and uh, we've been now working with them for three years, and um, the section is active, has a chair, and we're in the, in the process of developing a certification examination with them. Ben, I don't think we could have done any of this without you. <laughs> you tend to say I did it, but we know that you did it. And this is uh, a legacy that you will leave for women of the uh, Americas for a long, long time. Thank you. Thank you. But tell me, what's been your biggest disappointment in all of this? Well, that's, a, that's an interesting question because I, I have not thought of disappointments. I have seen it all as a challenge. and. Uh, I, I, I tell you the truth, I've, I've not been disappointed in any way. It's always been positive, and I've had your support, the support of, uh, of the board, the support of other people in the college, and, and we have made it such that it was successful, so I, I don't have any. Do you think, as we look forward to this, that this is a program that we could also export sometime in the future to places like uh, Uruguay, Paraguay, Bolivia? I, I think so. I, I think as long as the college maintains its interest in improving the care of the Latin American woman, there will be opportunities because I'm sure that many of those countries, as they see the progress and the success achieved uh, in, in the other countries will want to be part of, of the American college. Can we see a measurable success, say, in maternal mortality in any of these countries based on what we've been doing? Yes, yes, definitely. Uh, uh, there is a gentleman who was involved with us in, uh, in El Salvador who now is in, an, in, in Guatemala 
implementing some of the changes that we implemented in El Salvador during the Save the Mother, like um, uh, the concept of um, verbal autopsies uh, and improving the training of the people who take care of uh, pregnant women. And he definitely showed a decrease in the maternal mortality rate in El Salvador and the group in Guatemala also uh, demonstrated that. One of the things that uh, several of our presidents have indicated is that our college needs to be more cognizant of international responsibilities. Do you think we're fulfilling some of that in doing this work in Central America? I think in South America, yes, in Latin America, definitely, yes. This project has really accomplished that. Let me take you back to the years that you were at Wisconsin. If a young woman or man who's a member of president had come to you and ask, what do you see the opportunities of working internationally, what would you have told them then? When I was in Wisconsin, I would have said it was difficult. <laughs> and why would you have said that? I said difficult because, um, First of all, the college was more involved with activities in Africa. There wasn't much going on in, in Latin America. And uh, there wasn't this global interest in women's health care. This is a more recent uh, uh, interest. Do you think that's good for the college? I think it's excellent for it. I think it's a must. I think the college needs to do that. What would you recommend to a, a young resident finishing today that came to you and said, Dr. Curet, I want to go work someplace. I don't want to be in the United States. I want to go work where I can help people. Where would you recommend they go? I would recommend that they go to Central America. Any particular in place? In particular, Nicaragua. And what skill would you say they would have to take with them? They really would need to have the skill to work hard. <laughs> I don't think you require any special skills for it. You just need to have the desire and the interest and the dedication to put time to take care of the women. Would they need to be fluent in the Spanish language? Well, that's an interesting question. That would certainly be very, very desirable. However, there are enough people who speak both languages that they could do some, some work uh, with the use of interpreters. But I think it would be preferable if they spoke the language, yes. Let me take you back to ACOG itself. Now, you've been part of the inner structure of ACOG, the executive board, and all of that. What do you see the future of ACOG? I see the future of ACOG of being more international. I think that's, that's, that's where we need to work at. Uh, we need to send more people to other countries. We need to work with people in other countries. We need to bring people from other countries here so that they can see how we do things. They can get some training here. And that would be from an educational training point of view. In the future, ECO will always have the responsibility of uh, looking at, at the issues of, of women's care, of women care here in the United States, That's all, that will always be a part of, of ACOG. But I, I think the future of ACOG should be in the international arena. Do you think that our experience in Central and South America could be of help to our ever-growing Hispanic population in the United States? Yes. Yes. Uh, not, not only not only for the level of care, but the understanding of the culture, so that the care can be given within the context of the appropriate culture. What aspect of the culture do you think that we could probably improve upon the most? I think we have improved in, in, in the respect shown to, to the dignity of the, of the female patient. They're treated like uh, human beings, uh, listening to them, what their desires are what they want to do. I think we have improved a lot on that. Very good. Well, Ben, it's, you've done a marvelous thing. Now, I know you keep giving credit to other people, <laughs> but 
I can honestly say, I think the general feeling is, and I know my own personal feeling, we could never have accomplished what we've accomplished without your dedication and hard work. How many trips do you think that you've made on behalf of the college <laughs> to Central America? Oh, man. <laughs> I, oh. I can't even. I don't Is it in the hundreds already? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We, you know, we've been doing this for, what, 14 years? Now, one big issue that we've always come up with, do you think we will ever get to Cuba? Well, that's an interesting question because a while back, I think if you remember, we got some communication from Cuba. There was a, a doctor there in Cuba who was interested in pursuing this. It just the, the political situation made it impossible. But I, you know, I've been to Cuba and I've talked to some of the doctors in Cuba, and I think if, we, if politically the situation can be resolved, I, I think yes, we, we there will be a future for Cuba and us at the medical uh, level. Well, that will be something for us to look forward in the future. Hope both you and I are around <laughs> when that happens. <laughs> right, I would like that, I would like that. Ben, I appreciate your very much coming in and sharing with us. You've been a wonderful asset to ACOG. You've done more than anyone could have ever dreamed to ask you to do. So thank you for what you've done for ACOG. Thank you very much. And thank much. you for coming and sharing with it. So hopefully in the future, people who are interested, we'll see that you've laid out a very wonderful roadmap and a template which they can follow. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure.